This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii on a given Monday, Martin Luther King Day, as it were. And we're talking about community matters. And we have a community activist to discuss Martin Luther King uh, Day today, and that's Marcia Joyner, who is also a host on Think Tech Hawaii. And not one, but two shows. And now she joins us for a really special week. She joins us by vo VoIP phone uh, from remote, and we want to talk to her about Martin Luther King Day. Welcome to the show. Well, aloha, and thank you so much for being interested of course, and, of course. in Martin Luther King Day. Of course, this, is, this a is a big part of American history. Hard now, I want to yeah. I want to qualify you for a minute. Uh, you you're a community activist, and you started out as a community activist pretty early in the game in the '60s. Can you tell us your background right. in that regard? Well, I was born into Jim Crow and came of life of of age rather in the civil rights movement. I was the first black girl to go to integrated schools in Baltimore. Uh, in fact, the board, Brown versus Board of Education was May of 1954 and I entered school in August of 1954. So it was immediately. And, and you know me well enough to know in all the audiences, I love to talk. So I spent all of that time in school with all of these white girls. No one spoke to me. No one mistreated me. No one shared their notes. No one sat next to me at lunch. I went through all that with not a word. So what did you take so, away from all that, Marsha? You get angry with that. Are you angry? No. No. I'll, let me tell you the story. When, <laughs> you'll love this little story. So in May and when the decision was handed down and I'm watching television like everybody else does and all of these women across the country were screaming and yelling we're not going to send our children to school with these colored children and in Baltimore was this very beautiful lovely lady Mrs. Coughlin dressed in a lovely pink suit and beautiful white hair uh, and she, in, in Baltimore, the schools were not only segregated by race, but they were segregated by gender. So, and the higher class, the more segregated. Anyway, she says, I will never see a colored girl graduate from my school. That's wow. me. Wow, August, I like that. August, five of us showed up at her school. Okay. Now, she was very nice. The whole time we were there, never a hint of trouble, never, ever. However, one week, one week before graduation, Mrs. Coughlin turned her face to the wall and died. She never saw a colored girl graduate from her school. <laughs> now, I took it as a personal affront, and it's only been 60 years and I'll get over it, but not today. <laughs> not today, no. <laughs> not today. So not let's today. let's talk about yeah. uh, Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King Day. Um, yeah. You know, what is okay. what is his so, significance in the historical landscape of the country? I mean, he came at a time when um, people were wrestling with this issue, with racism, um, trying to find oh. equality, and he surfaced as a great leader. Um, so, you know, in my view, and I'm not as close to it as you are, but. In my view, I, I believe that he was one of the great leaders of our nation, um, and he and he and he emerged while you were you were you know becoming yes. becoming aware. Yes. Oh yeah. No. Uh, yes. And I did all the sit-ins and the demonstrations and everything I learned. I learned in the basement of the church because all the Protestant churches gave us. The basement of the church, and, and you know, on the mainland, everybody has a basement because of, that's where the furnace and everything is. So the church's works happened in the basement. The typewriters, the telephones, the mimeograph machines. And so everything I learned, I learned how to do what we do in demonstrations and picketing and organizing and press releases, the whole thing. 
those were the women's jobs during the civil rights movement. The men were on the picket line. That's why you, when you look at pictures, you see very few women. But we were part of it. There, make no mistake about it. And he was a hero. And in every major city across America, there were heroes, not as eloquent as he, but every bit as forceful and determined and uh, and beautiful. Well, that that's raises he, an interesting point, Marsha. I mean, there were heroes in a lot of cities. And there was a time when yeah. the civil rights uh, movement was coming of age. And it wasn't only, oh. you know, Martin Luther King and other ministers around the country. It was, was, was people who were not necessarily black uh, who were, you know, raising the flag on this. So what yeah. was it with yeah. Martin in Luther King? In Montgomery, yeah. uh, with, you know, with the boycott, the bus boycott, what is not talked about are the, you know, because most of the people that boycotted the, uh, the bus were working in the white people's houses. And it was those wives that came together and told the business people of Montgomery, you have got to stop this now. The owner of the bus was a owner. She said to her husband, this has got to stop. We have got to have our people back. They walked the picket line. These white women were out there. Uh, it's not talked about, but they were part of it. It was an economic thing. They <laughs> felt the economic part of it, and they wanted it stopped. This has got this is this has got to cease and desist. I know we don't talk about it, but that was they were as much a part of this as any black person. Well, I'll tell you a short story. When I was stationed in the Coast Guard first in Hawaii, and then I they transferred me back to New York, which was my original home. And um, when I got back there, I, I was looking for my boss, who was a commander and a lawyer in the Coast Guard, a very good lawyer. And he was not there. Nobody could explain what happened to him. He, was, he had gone um, on vacation and hadn't returned. This is pretty serious for a senior officer not to return. Where was he? He was in jail uh, in the South. He'd been on a freedom ride, and he got arrested. And they put him in jail. He could only come back and resume his duties after he got out of jail. Uh, mm -hmm. He was white, by the way. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was really extraordinary what was happening. I mean, we had a national movement going on. And, uh, you know, it was, there was a lot of people. A lot of people were joining that movement at that time. And certainly Mar it, Martin Luther King was the leader of that movement then. Why did he, you know, surface as the leader? Why did he, the one person who everybody rallied around, what was it about him? His eloquence, the way he said what needed to be said in a way that people understood it, that the the tone of his voice, the the eloquence with which he, he moved. And uh, let's go back to Montgomery and the bus boycott. When he moved to Montgomery, he was the new preacher in town. And he was elected to head the Montgomery bus boycott. And you know the reason why he was elected. Ah, yes, he's a great orator. Make no mistake. I don't want to belittle that. But he was new in town. He did not have a mortgage. He did not have a car payment. He did not owe, have anything in the bank. And that was the way the city fathers controlled people was through finances. They could not control him. They couldn't fire him. They couldn't call in the mortgage or the car payment. So he was the one person, the new preacher in town, that was elected. <laughs> and that, and that, his experience in Alabama, um, you know, made him made him a national figure. But he originally right. came from he originally came from Atlanta, didn't he? Yeah, he came from Georgia. Yeah. But even yep, yeah, and well. Again, we go back a little further. He was on a trip to Europe with his family as a young man. His, his name was originally Michael, and his father's a minister. And they learned about Martin Luther, the, the one man that stood up to the Catholic Church. You remember the notice on the door of the church? 
they were so impressed with him taking a stand against the power, because the Catholic Church was the power, that that they changed their names mm -hmm. to Martin Luther, from mm -hmm. Michael to Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was that willingness to take a stand. What he studied Gandhi, that willingness to take a stand. Because mm -hmm. most of us won't take a stand because we're scared. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a, is a matter of taking stands. Leadership is clearly you know, taking positions and sticking with them. Um, and if, if yes. you've seen that movie uh, about uh, Churchill, The Darkest Hour, I, it might still be playing. Darkest Hour. That is a very good example of, of, uh, of, of leadership where he, he took an unpopular mm -hmm. position. Everybody was fighting with him about it, but he knew he was right and he stuck with it. And what we need is more of that today, Martha, Marcia. See, I can take a stand because you won't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about well, today. Let's talk about today okay. here in Honolulu. Uh, there's a parade. Right. It started at nine o'clock here downtown. Uh, what is the parade about? Who's involved? Okay. As uh, far as I know, there were a hundred units in the parade, and this parade is unlike any other parade. Is a First Amendment parade. We operate under a court order. And the court says that the city and county has to allow us, this parade, um, police protection, um, to, to use of the street and, and the parks, uh, Alma Moana Park for the staging area, and Kapiolani Park for the Unity Rally after. And that is because every unit in the parade is allowed to take a stand. Now, the only thing that's not allowed is hate language. So everybody that's in the parade has an issue about something. Mm -hmm. You know, stop the war, whatever. Mm -hmm. They've all got issues. Which makes it really interesting, colorful, because all of these people come together at this one time. And that is magic. It um, is magic. It's we such have, an Amer it American is. tradition. And we the Rosa, Rosa Parks bus, the city and county lets us have a city bus that is dedicated to the Martin Luther King Parade and Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. Big sign on the side says Rosa Parks. And then the city, also we have the rubbish truck. And the UPW, oh, you can't believe that a rubbish truck would gleam, but they have such pride in it to be in the parade. And that says, Memphis, we remember. Sure. There was, why don't you tell yeah. our listeners about Memphis? What happened in Memphis? Memphis, Martin Luther King went to Memphis to be with the garbage workers who were on strike. And they were terribly treated. It, it, it's almost inhumane to think that people were treated like they were, especially and this, that's because most people don't see that collecting rubbish is as important. But it, when it's not picked up, you know, you get all kind of viruses and rats <laughs> and course. stuff. So, but that they are important to our health and well-being. And so he was there to um, help with that strike. And somebody somewhere upset the strike the day before. And so it went really crazy. So the night before the the uh, day that he was planned to go on strike, to, to walk with the, the garbage list. Let's rewind this. If you look at pictures of Martin Luther King in a march, in crowds, you will see all of the men on the front row have on the same suit and they have the same uh, flower or whatever on the suit and then you know all white folks think we all look alike anyway so here's this front row if you are assassin you can't pick him out of the front row so that was the whole idea that was their camouflage that we all look alike so the now the idea is that in order to assassinate him, you have to take him out of the crowd. 
Well, and so the night before, he is staying at the Lorraine Hotel, and the um, there was a young man, and I'll have to look up his name for you, and he was singing gospel songs. He's down on the ground, and the Lorraine Motel, I think this was the second floor, Martin Luther King comes out on the balcony and talks to him and says, sing my favorite song. And he begins to sing, Precious Lord, when the shots are fired from behind him. And that's how they picked him out of the crowd and, and shot him. Mm. Now, I am sure, I can't find it anywhere, but I'm sure that that gospel singer must have gone to his grave feeling guilty. Yeah. You know, can you imagine the horrors? But you've heard the speech that he gave the night before. Mm -hmm. I have been to the mountaintop. Everyone's heard that. Everyone's heard that. Yeah. Now, in the speech, anybody that's interested, scroll down 23 minutes into the speech. Martin Luther King never said anything short. <laughs> so 23 minutes into the speech, he begins to say what we have, what we bring to the table is economic power. And you have got to look at your economic power. You have got to put support such and such a bank. Then he begins to say, you have to stop buying Wonder Bread. You have to stop buying Coca-Cola. And he went down the list of all of those big corporations that you have got to take your money out of. Mm -hmm. And the next day he's dead. Yeah. See, so I'm sure that they killed him. Well, let's take a short break. Um, okay. I, I want to come back and I want to tell you about some of the articles about racism that are here in okay. the New York Times this very day and get your reaction to that. And we'll discuss okay. more about Martin Luther King Day right after this break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. They said I could play, so any chance to play at all. That's my life. I love music. Yeah. I saw it. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on ThinkTech Hawaii Fridays at 3 p.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. We explore environmental issues, political issues, keeping it local any way we can. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Marcia Joyner, community activist. We're talking about Martin Luther King Day. And in fact, the title of our show is Martin Luther King Day comes at exactly the right time. One of the reasons I say that is uh, I'm looking at the New York Times today online, the top stories, and a good number of them are, are about racism. And I'll just tick off the headlines for you if you haven't heard. One, I'm not a racist. Trump says, as DACA hopes dim. He says he's not a racist. Um, okay, another one. Um, experts fear that the president's remarks could set back American interests in Africa. Um, another one. In Trump's remarks, black churches see a nation backsliding. Um, another one. Can I comment on that? Yeah, sure. Despite Trump's own insistence that he's the least racist person that you've ever met. That's what he said. Devotee. Yeah, that's what he said. But those devoted racists like Duke, whatever his name was, are thrilled that the Donald has sparked an insurgency and open racism. See, that's the, that's the trick. It's not 
Yeah. Okay. So he said one or two words, but he has allowed that to to. I, I'm sure there's a better word than insurgency, but we see it, we hear it from people that we never thought we'd hear it from. Again, well, I thought this was over, and it's again, and and I hear it even here in Hawaii. Yeah, I've heard it Things, too. I've heard I've heard it too, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's. it's it's too bad that uh, in the 60s, you and I both grew up in the 60s, we had a maybe Martin Luther King's vision of a better time coming forward, you know, a more uh, a greater equality in the country. But um, to use the, the term that we use in that uh, headline, uh, backsliding, we've been backsliding. Yes. And a lot of it yes. has been in the last uh, year or two with Trump. Let me, let me go on and uh, tell you some more. Okay. Donald Trump's racism, this is my personal favorite, the definitive list. Um, this is where um, I, I don't know what the uh, who, who the journalists were, but the New York Times journalists went through and and made a list of all the things that he'd said that proved he was a racist. Um, the definitive list is a long list. Okay, here's another one: Charles Blow, a column. Trump is a racist. Period. Same point. Uh, George Yancey. Uh, will America choose King's Dream or Trump's Nightmare? Um, oh, I like that. Yeah, there, you know I, there are more. I, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, the interesting question is uh, whether. Um, w I guess that's all I can find right now. But whether uh, Trump is a, is is making war on the press or wh whether he's in a war with the press. And I know it's a it's a fine point. But I, I believe that he's he's making war on the press, and I believe that he's uh, he knows very well he's responsible for some of this racism, and uh, if not a lot of it in his term. Um, and what we have is a backsliding. We have um, we have more tension now than we did when he started. What kind of an achievement is that? So uh, let's yeah. let's go to you know how how does the black community feel about this? How how do you feel about this? Um, you know what what's the condition of the country on this issue? I am encouraged by the, the the ones that you read about what I hear and see when people, not just black people or Hispanics or Hawaiians, who stand up and speak up and say, you know, this is wrong. Um, I don't like this. I don't like the way it feels. I'm encouraged because I think I haven't seen this kind of organizing this kind of energy since the 60s and the 70s. People are organized, people are willing to take a stand, and that's good. That feels real good that they are this, uh, like Martin Luther King said, a time comes when silence is betrayal and people are speaking up, people. When did you see the most prominent newspaper with headlines like that? Well, I, you know, what it tells me, though, is that the, it's not just the black community that's irritated and annoyed by what's happened here under Trump. It's it's a lot of people. In fact, it's uh, it's, it's, it's it's well, I think it's most people in the country are irritated by it. How do you like that? And so, you know, we have a problem that is that is created. Maybe it's in Trump's base, if you will, where the problem is is enhanced lately. Um, but I think there's a lot of people who would like to see the problem corrected, Mar Mar Marcia. And so I think so. I, I really agree that that is it. And that's why I am saying uh, that the one thing we have, and it doesn't matter what color you are, what gender, uh, is the vote. And if we are going to stand up to the vitriol, uh, we that he is spewing. And one of the things that Martin Luther King said, that we will rue the day when people of good people say nothing about what this is going on. When we say nothing, that is a problem. People that think they are good and don't say anything. We gotta and say something. Uh, got, uh, yeah, I totally agree. And, and I think it's important to have a kind of a First Amendment experience about this because if you don't do anything and if everybody's quiet about it and it continues to happen, ultimately you lead into much greater contention. Uh, you lead into street scenes, riots, what have you, 
all kinds of breakdown of civil society. Um, and I, we can't afford that. We have, we have too much to do in this country um, to be distracted by that. Um, so, you know, I, one of the things, one of the reasons I like what you're saying, I think it's important, there are many reasons, but is that it will avoid further contention. It will avoid, you know, further polarization with two racial bubbles. I hate that. Um, and so yeah. uh, the vote is, is more important than you think. It's important in many ways. And uh, my hero, I, I know we're running out of time, my hero is Fannie Lou Hamer. Now, I know you've got a whole, everybody just went blank, Fannie Lou Hamer. Who is Fannie she Lou was, Hamer? Yeah. She was the strongest woman that was ever. She was, you know, on a slave plantation in Rule County, Mississippi, Ruleville, Mississippi. And all she wanted to do was register to vote. And she had heard one of Martin Luther King's speeches, and she knew she wanted to register to vote. And she, I'm going to get this fast. She came near death trying to register to vote. And she led a movement. The book is titled This Little Light of Mine, and anybody that's interested. And so... August of 1964, a Democratic convention in Atlantic City, and she led the Mississippi Freedom uh, Democratic Movement, and it was made of black people and white people and men and women and whatnot. They all went to, well, they get to the convention, of course, and it's all white and mainly men, and she says that they are legally together and they want to be seated well president johnson interfered and it was a mess it was a grand mess and it's really worth reading about but anyway because this little, of, this little they, light this little light well, this little light of mine what was it this little light of mine is the name of the book okay. and anyway she says you know they they let her speak and because of her and all of the things that happened, the Democratic Party changed forever. And in fact, this year it'll be fifty years. Well, we yeah, need we need, we need some we need some real um, political juice going forward. And um, yeah. it, se it seems to me that the, the the voting rate in here in Hawaii in general is less than forty percent. That's an embarrassment. And uh, if people it, care about these it, issues, if I, they care about, you know, think, making a responsible yeah. government, and if they don't agree with Trump, all the more reason, um, they've got to get out and vote. They've got to express themselves. It's the most, uh, it talk about the First Amendment, uh, you know, this is the, you know, the center of citizen expression. And, um, and the same thing with the black community. Their, their uh, voting percentage was not that high in 2016. And I think things would have been different in the presidential race had they gotten out to vote, uh, more of them. So what, you know, what, what can happen? What do you want to see? And what is your advice to everyone about this come November? Well, you know, there's a primary. We all have to, uh, we are fortunate in Hawaii in that, you know, we only have four candidates for the uh, two for the House and two for the Senate. Well, only two in the House are running. But last year we had 51 House candidates. 30 of them ran unopposed. No, but there's nothing to vote for. You know, that's the problem. Well, this comes back to Martin Luther King as a leader. You know, if there, yes. if there are clear leaders, whatever their persuasion, if there are clear leaders, then people tend to rally around and vote for those leaders. That's the way democracy works. That's the way the reality is. And so, uh, what you know, yeah. what what will happen between now now and then, Marsha? Who is going to be the clear leader, on on whatever side yeah. of the fence you like, uh, uh, opposed to Trump, I suppose. But we need to look at turnout because if you're not happy with our legislature, every one of them got those seats because of low turnout. So we need to make sure that we turn out because if they see there's no consequence for not doing what we want, they'll continue to 
not do what we want. Okay, what, what about the national elections now? Speak to the national election. It's the same thing. It has to be turnout. We saw what happened in Alabama when there was turnout. Right. And that's what we have to do. We have to be sure that we turn out. We have to be sure that we are, are registered. Last year, two years ago, we did a national voter registration day. We had 8,000 new people registered. They didn't turn out to vote. Yeah, they that's, that's, that's they a disappointment. Vote. That's a disappointment. You go to all the trouble. <laughs> and, you know, <clears throat> as we've discussed offline, some of these voter registration drives have been have been uh, very risky business and it resulted in, in killings in the past. And so uh, when somebody approaches you and suggests you should register, that's a, a really serious thing. And if you do register, that's a really serious thing. And if you've gone through all of that, you really need to get out and vote. You want to protect your way of life, your family, your community, mm -hmm. the society, you have to vote. Yeah, it's amazing. But if there's nothing to vote for, so we have to make sure there's something to vote for. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's clear enough that we want to vote against racism or anybody who is racist. Yeah. And that's the message yes, of Martin Luther King Day. Marsha Joyner, a, a, a activist, a community activist, also a host on Think Tech, uh, has joined us for a discussion of Martin Luther King Day, which comes today, this time, at the perfect time. Thank you so much, Marsha, for joining us. We'll see you later this week for your shows. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.